proper in both Surrender Road and uh, uh, Tehran, 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 oh, I don't know, Tehranidot, forgive me, certified in somatic voice work and the low Verti method. Please welcome Miss Nancy Allen. <laughs> So, That's a hard one to pronounce. <laughs> how bad is my enunciation? It's, I need it's some okay. vocal, don't I? <laughs> how are you, Nancy? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me, Patrick. Oh, thank you so much for being here. The last time I saw you was pre-COVID when I got to meet you for the first time at, at the Frothy Monkey. Yay, Frothy we, Monkey. They have yes. the best lavender coffee. Mm. Yes, they do. A nice little heart that comes in time. It's yeah. beautiful. Um, well, first of all, you know, in reading your resume, I'm going... Okay, so you're an actress. You're a singer. How's your dance? <laughs> do, do tell. Are well, you a let me tell girl? you, my dance is not very strong, but I did play a dance instructor as my last role I played. <laughs> so so I, I had to dance. Oh, um, okay. And you had to learn. And, and a five, six, seven. <laughs> I do my best. I, I do it. my best, which is all I can ask of my students, you know. So. Well, if you want to take dance, you know, I'm married to a pretty good choreographer dancer. So if you want some private lessons, she's been giving them virtually all over. <laughs> In my other life, the only thing I can ever see me wanting to do is to be a dancer. Really? So, yeah. I hear I you. Back, that's what I want to do. I want to tap dance and ballet. I love it all. And I get enthralled. I'm the, I'm the best audience member. Oh, well, yeah, I, I, I agree. I've, I've become really good friends during this this lockdown with Paul Vasterling at the National Ballet. Oh, yeah. Director, and, and we're planning something together, but I can't talk about that. Okay. I want to ask you about, um, so 10 years ago, I became a teacher. I started teaching 10 years ago. And, and I literally started doing it out of, I'd been a coach for my kids in sports. I loved working with kids. And then I thought, well, I've been doing this 40 years. I know a little bit about musical theater. I know a little bit about acting. Why not give it back in a way that I really enjoy, which is watching kids, you know, flourish and grow. So I started teaching and, and I fell in love with it. I just fell in love with it. Is that, how did you get into teaching from being a performer yourself? So a uh, similar situation. I did not go into performing with the idea that I wanted to be a teacher um, but ended up teaching and falling in love with it. I, there are moments where my students um, grab onto a concept and I see the joy in their face or I see tears in their eyes when they realize they can do something they thought they couldn't. And that's as much of a high as being on the stage and, and hearing the applause for yourself, if not more so. Mm -hmm. um, I will have to give the kudos to Marjorie Halbert here in Nashville, Tennessee. She is the one who um, brought me in at Belmont University into the musical theater department. I was teaching classical voice, but performing in musical theater. And she gave me my dream job. She said, how would you like to teach musical theater all day? And I said, yay. Oh, wow. wow. I'm very grateful to her and to Belmont University for allowing me to spend every single day with incredibly talented students who are driven and smart and creative and fun and kind. And um, to get to help them develop their tools is, is a true blessing. And talented. I've seen yeah. a lot of your kids. They're talented. We use a lot of your kids. Your kids do Art Studio 10 shows. They do. Very talented. A bunch. Okay. So before I, I want to ask you, I'm going to talk a bit. I want to talk to you about teaching and, and versus having done it. Like, so you're a performer and now you're a teacher. But, but before that, so what is the future right now for Belmont in terms of teaching? Where are you guys out in terms of in COVID? Are you guys going to go back to class, virtual? What is the deal? Well, our plan is to be in person starting. Um, it's kind of a, a staggered start, but we want to be back in person by September 11th. I believe it's between the 4th and the 11th that the students are coming back to campus. Mm -hmm. So uh, just, you know, encourage everybody to keep doing the masks and the social distancing and the sanitizer. And, you know, if we keep this up, Nashville will get in line and Belmont will be able to go um, what we call high flex. I love that word. The high flex mode is a mode where we will be teaching in person, but also through Zoom, also through what we call asynchronous teaching, which is where the students can do some video work send it into us and then we give feedback. And um, so with this kind of multifaceted uh, teaching method, we think we can still give the content that our students need to be um, striving for excellence. That's great. Oh, that's great. So it will be then a combination. I mean, they're yeah. going to be back on campus, but you're also going to be, which by the way, I really believe that once we get a vaccine and all that, I still think that's going to become the new norm. 
I think, that's, I think that is forever. I do. I really do. Yeah. Before this ever hit, we were already training our students on how to self tape and how to submit for um, jobs through, um, you know, this new um, vehicle of video. And that's absolutely the wave of the future. It already was before COVID and COVID has just forced us to step it up um, and, and get better at it. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It has been, as we all know, the creative part of this, you know, I came here getting ready to produce shows and direct shows and do that. And everything that we've done has been virtual, including Absolutely. education, including this talk show, including yeah. a gala, you know, the, including a contest. And, and, and that just that ability to sort of recreate and redefine how we're going to work and has been actually a blessing. Yeah, it really home. has. I keep telling my students, you know, I know that they're disheartened and I know it's difficult, but I just keep telling them that this season is so good for us. It's so good for us to have to regroup and rethink and retool and be creative and band together and support each other in every way that we can. So, you know, you, know, you also have, have I got our, to, our, our morale building and, and character building. You also have that great. I got to watch some uh, rehearsals for Cinderella. You have that wonderful space down there. That's pretty nice at Belmont. Well, we're going to have a beautiful space in about a year and a half, a huge state of the art theater. And it's going to be a blessing both to Belmont and to Nashville. Can we Studio 10 please rehearse there too? I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. I hope we're going to be doing some shows together there. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Yeah. Uh, so I want, I'm dying to talk to you about something that has sort of plagued me because as I said before, you know, I, I started teaching 10 years ago. I fell in love with it. I opened up my own little acting academy in California called Hollywood Stage Academy. That then garnered me, I started going to colleges and then I learned to direct from colleges, but I, I teach and I would teach semesters as a guest teacher, both at Western Michigan University, at Point Park University. And then that went into Vegas and I was the uh, the resident director at the Wynn Hotel for three years for Showstoppers and, and all this. So it comes time for me wanting to really teach. Now I didn't go to college, right? So I never got a degree, right? But I have 40 years of experience. You've got some good experience. <laughs> yeah, I have 40 years in television. I have 40 years in film. I have 40 years on the stage. I have 40 years of this. And you've got genetics. And I have some genetics. Yes, those go, those go a long way. And I'll ask, I'm going to ask our next guest, Gary, about this too, because so I am not taking anything away from getting a degree in teaching. It is incredibly important. It is incredibly, um, it's, it's a must you have to do. But in your opinion, as a teacher, and you've had a lot of experience as a performer too, do you think it's right that somebody that has that kind of resume that has been doing that shouldn't be allowed to teach on a college level simply because they don't have a degree? Well, I, I am going to plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, did you go safe. <laughs> well, my institution does believe that um, they want every teacher there to have their master's or higher. Right. Um, but I'm going to say that there is this new thing that Belmont is embracing as well, which is much more practical. It's a professor of practice. To come. And it's someone who has gained that experience through the industry. And right. they do recognize that that is extremely valuable. And so I think they're, you know, Belmont and other universities are trying to marry the two so that they have educators and experienced people. Um, and then we also try to bridge that gap with, um, we bring in so many master classes. I cannot wait for my students to have their, what we are calling a flipped master class with you. You'll come to campus. Too. You Assuming that campus will be open because, you know, COVID will be better. You'll come to campus. You'll be there with our seniors. And then the others in the program will watch through Zoom. Oh, I, so, can't, I can't wait. I so can't wait. We'd all be in a room together and you'd be, you know, teaching and, and all together. But we'll be doing it flipped master class wise. But there is um, a wealth of information that someone who has spent as much time in the industry as you as you have has been with so many people in the industry and had so many experiences. And, you know, a lot of that you can't learn from a book. You've got mm -hmm. to go and experience. And then you have to, um, it's so fun then to give that experience to students and they're hungry for that. They want to ask questions. They want to know what you know from, you know, that in-person experience of being in the industry. So well, we then it brings me to my next question. Can I have a job? No. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, well, thank you for saying that. I mean, because 
it, it's an interesting thing. I love to teach. I love to teach. I think I, I sometimes think had I had I gotten into teaching when I was 25, I might have even loved it more than performing into even then, because there is something more gratifying to me than showing, giving my knowledge and experience, as you said, to somebody else and watching their dream or them nurture as, as a performer than it is even doing a song for me, yeah. you know, or, or, or a scene. You yeah. know? Also, I know for me, like when I teach, I'm, I'm drawing, I'm pulling on experience. I'm also pulling on, you know, things that I've learned in a classroom, things that I've learned from a mentor, from my own teachers. I, I joke about my students. We have a direct line to um, Stravinsky. Um, if you look at who studied with who down the, the line in my voice studio, and I like to point out that everything that I'm teaching them is coming from the teachers before me. But also, I mean, I am I am so much better at performing because of my teaching. Oh, I mean, yeah. totally. I see it in my students and I see and also I'm better. I'm a better singer because of recording. You know, you hear it and you can analyze it. And then when you go to do it live, you're just that much better at it. So my teaching has informed my performing just as much as my performing has informed my teaching. Yeah, absolutely. So, which brings me to the next thing. So it says that you are certified, you have a certification in the somatic voice work and it's the Lovetri method? Jeannie Lovetri, yes. Okay, so tell me, explain, I can barely pronounce that. Explain to me well, what that is. That's her name. She's a phenomenal teacher, um, well known across the country as someone who works in, um, just to summarize, we're gonna call it functional voice. She teaches and um, trains teachers to bring um, her method into the voice studio that, that helps the voice function in the most natural way it should to do what it needs to do. And our, our specialty is to bring that into the more commercial styles. So uh, what we, what we, when we call um, commercial music, we call that pop, rock, musical theater, um, blues, mm -hmm. jazz, country, all of these styles that come from normal everyday people, untrained people. And yet they do require skills and they do require knowledge of the instrument. And so she, her method helps us to teach that way. Wow, amazing. I'd, I'd actually, can I, oh, there's Tony McAllister. Hey, you have a job. Uh, oh, I, oh, oh, he's saying it. he's getting angry with me because I do have a job. That's right, that's <laughs> right. And I'm, very, and I'm very, very fortunate to have that job. Teaching is such a rewarding career, Jennifer. Yes, it, it sure is. I totally agree. Um, I love Jennifer's mask. I like her picture. I brought a mask. I want y'all to see my mask. They, they just arrived and I'm kind of excited about them. I don't know if you can see. The, you can see. Oh, it's that way. Oh, my God. So, it says so I heart B U M T, oh, which is Belmont University Musical Theater. <laughs> oh, I love that! I'll have to. So I want to. I want a mask when I take a lesson. Okay. In the, I want you to give me a lesson in that. That sounds okay. fantastic. <laughs> so, uh, so we normally play a game on this show. Sometimes they get, and we're not going to play it this way because I've got something so in store for Mr. Gary Cole. But Yay. I had an idea off the off the cuff. Uh, Jenny and company. I played Bobby and company, so I know that. Uh, yeah, if you're, you're going to ask me to sing anything, I can't remember what I did yesterday. I'm just going to ask: Does Jenny sing the part where he, where the answer is "Today is for Amy"? Does Jenny sing that big soprano thing? She sings the wedding, getting ready for the wedding. Yeah, right. That, yes, part, that, part. that whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to take like two lines? No. Of it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that has a. <laughs> no, it's got that B flat in it. Every day I sang that, I had to go in the stairwell and do woo, a lot of who's and ahs to you know, to make sure that B flat was going to come out that day. <laughs> I, I know it so well. I know. I, I, know a, I both my feet are in the mezzo world, so that was a challenge for me. But I liked the challenge. I enjoyed singing that role a lot. Well, we'll bring you back on to sing the song. We'll give you a few times to work on it. Okay. <laughs> it, it is such a pleasure, Nancy, to talk to you and to see you again. You look absolutely stunning. Oh, I um, I, we let us let us you and I continue to contact. I can't wait to come teach at Belmont. I can't wait to hang with you and and thank you for being a part of this today. Thank you. My students are in for a real treat. Oh, for me too. Great to see you, Nancy. Thanks again. We'll see you thank soon. You. Bye bye. Oh man, that was great. That was great. I'm going to take that lesson. The somatic. I have to. I, I thought I knew a lot about voice, but I don't know at all. Okay. Um, this guy is a pretty great guy. This guy. I'm. We've. I've gotten to interview a lot of my friends on the show, but I know. I know this man 25 years and more.
Anyway, I'm going to introduce him. It's the, the resume goes on and on and on and on, but we'll take some of the finer points. So Gary Cole is an actor. He's a voice actor with over 170 film credits. Oh, God, do I want your pension, Gary. But he began his career on stage at the Steppenwolf Theater Company. He appeared off-Broadway uh, in True West and Heartless. Um, he, his films include Office Space, Talladega Nights, Pineapple Express, and Dodgeball. Screen Actors Guild Award for Outstanding Performance by an Ensemble in a Comedy Series. Currently a cast member in Mixed-ish on ABC, as well as The Good Fight on CBS, all access. That's, I mean, there's, okay, we're going to talk about all this stuff. These, these are just, please welcome a good friend of mine. He's an amazing guy, Mr. Gary Cole. There he is. Hello, oh sir. God. How oh are you? I'm, I'm okay. I wish I looked as young as you did. And I know that you're a little older than me, but you look a lot better than I do. <laughs> oh. How are you, G-Man? How you doing, man? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you so much for, for being a part of this. I was going through one of the great things about doing this is that, uh, I mean, I, the people are, are friends and I've worked with them and all that stuff, but you start to look at their resumes of what they've done, what they've accomplished in their careers. And forgive me, but yours is a joke. What you've done. <laughs> it's like when you, there's nothing, it's a joke. I keep, all I kept saying is like, I want his pension. I want this guy's picture. <laughs> I mean, I how, I how old I am. That's all. <laughs> oh, no, no. I I know when you have start, you started, and we're going to talk about that for a second. In fact, you, so you got your start, and I, I want to talk about Steppenwolf, but you, you, you're from Chicago? Correct, right? yes. You got your start in Chicago, and, and we shared, and I know you still have her, the same personal manager, Barbara Gale. Right? Yes, that's true. Okay. That's and Barbara still represents you, right? Yes, she does. Yeah. Is she the one that was responsible for bringing you out to California from Chicago? In a, in a way, I mean, with a with a very brief stop in New York. The way the way I kind of transitioned from Chicago to Los Angeles and television was really connected to the theater, I think, in New York. I did two, and you mentioned uh, you mentioned one of them. I did True West in New York. I also did, and about a year later, I did another play called Orphans. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, an off-Broadway success uh, from Steppenwolf, both, both of which came from Chicago and transplanted to New York. Uh, the first time I met Barbara, uh, she came to that performance, and at that time she was an agent for William Morris. Yep, sure. Uh, and then shortly after, branched out and and, and uh, started her own, her management company. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been with her ever since. I've had several agents since then. I've kind of, you know, burned my bridges as I've gone, but, uh, you know, but uh, she's been the one constant. Yeah, so I've known Barbara, I mean, since I think we met in, I think it was 1985, the fall of 1985. So. Well, I've said this to you before. You and I've talked a lot about this. Please give her my love. Give her a hug. Give her a kiss. Tell her. Tell her. I, I said I've. I've really hit. I finally hit the final plateau. I get to interview Gary Cole. <laughs> <laughs> I've. I finally arrived. <laughs> She's amazing. And you're right. She was at William Morris. She was my agent. Oh, my brother Ryan says say hello to Gary Cole. Oh, hello, Ryan. There he is. Hello. Other Cassidy's join us. <laughs> Huge Gary Cole fan since Midnight Caller, Donna. There you Rick. go. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, she was she was my agent too, William Morris. That's right. what happened. And and then she teamed with Marty Litke, and then right. it was and it was Litke Gale and all, and all of that. Okay, so when did you join Steppenwolf? I I knew pretty much everybody that began Steppenwolf in college at Illinois State University, which is, you know, central Illinois, a couple hours south of Chicago. So when I was a sophomore uh, at the time uh, at, at, at Illinois State, uh, had John Malkovich was there, Lori Metcalf, Jeff Perry, uh, Joan Allen came later, but she was also, it, it, she went to Eastern Illinois University. So they all kind of converged. Was Gary there? Was Gary Sinise there? Gary Sinise did not go to college. He was playing rock and roll at the time. Oh, he was. Uh. He was basically <laughs> awaiting everybody's arrival 
in uh, I got it. Okay. So they went up and started the company basically, I believe it was the summer of 1976. Uh, and I still had a couple more years of school, but then I, the first show I did uh, post uh, college was in 1978 at their little, at the time, a like a, I think it was a 80 seat theater or a 76 seat theater uh, in a basement north of the city in a, in a suburb called Highland Park. North oh, sure. Of yeah. yeah. And, and, and what was the first play you did? Was first it thing I did was Philadelphia, Here I Come. Uh, <laughs> I Brian Friel. And, ah. uh, and I, I was uh, uh, sporting a horrible Irish accent. <laughs> <laughs> could you, could, could you, could we, could you demonstrate? Can we hear a little bit of that? Well, now? I'm trying to remember, you know, something like, it's right. Look, I'm telling you, or something like that. <laughs> All I know is I smoked a lot and wore a cardigan sweater. Oh, perfect. And drank That's Irish for you. <laughs> drank beer, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and when did you do, okay, so Malkovich and Sinise did True West. Were you part of that production? Yeah, or? I, I was a replacement. My my off-Broadway career was was going into plays that were already successful. So uh, a, I got it. It was a good move. So True West opened... Uh, I can't remember the exact, I think it was in 80, the fall of 82 with John Malkovich and Gary Sinise in the two main roles. And then probably that the following summer, it was still up and running. They had been gone for a couple of months with various understudies and kind of combinations. And then I did the play with Jim Belushi. Oh, sure. Uh, for about four and a half months. So uh, you were you were Austin and he was Lee. Austin, right. Yeah, right, the right. writer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you do. I would have loved to have seen you in that. I, by the way, I always wanted to do that with my brother Sean. Oh. And we're and I because I'm bigger than him. I would have played the older brother. I would have played Lee. But just the idea that I would have gotten to strangle him every night yes. that would have just been fantastic. And he gets to flip it and then strangle you. Yeah, later. And then he gets me. I know it's the yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so Barbara or one of you, you come out to California, and and I just want to make sure I'm right about this. And the first. Well, I can say I actually missed a, an important detail about that. In between Barbara and uh, Chicago was kind of a fluke that happened to me. I still had a Chicago agent, but that's when the miniseries Fatal Vision happened before the the second play I did in New York. So I was with a uh, an agent who was a terrific agent. She was a she was a local agent in Chicago named Ann Gettys. It's funny you should mention that. Because we okay. have a little clip from Mr. Fatal Vision. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was setting you up and I didn't even know it. <laughs> Perfectly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Gary Cole in one of his first, well, to young Gary Cole, Fatal Vision. Somebody stood the pot up. What you're telling me is that you're sitting there telling me that I killed my wife and kids. It's unbelievable. For God's sake, what would... What motive do I have? Why would I do that for? I think we could conjecture several reasons, perhaps. You, you don't you don't think that I was happily married? Well, I'm happily married, Captain, and I get pretty mad at my wife sometimes. Especially when I was younger and quicker to anger. You think I get mad enough at someone to, to do that? I've seen it happen before. Well, I'll tell you what it looks like to me. It, it looks like that you've, you've run out of things and you've picked someone, the easiest one. That's what it looks like to me. You've got to get solved before the fiscal year ends so that when you put the report in, you have a 100% solve rate. Well, now, now where do we go from here? <laughs> Who's that guy with the puffy face? Okay, so, okay. <laughs> okay, so listen. So you look at yourself there. I talked about this with my mom all the time, like when she sees Oklahoma or she says, and my mother literally says what you just said. She goes, who is that person? You know, and, and I say it too. I see myself and I go, who is that guy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's wild. I haven't seen that particular clip in a very long time. Yeah. And that was the first sort of 
because I remember again when Barbara, you guys, her saying, "You got to see this actor Gary Cole who did Fatal Vision. He's a phenomenal actor." That was the sort of the, the, right. the, the thing. It, it precede that, and it's yeah, that's how that's, that's that shows what happens to your memory. But <laughs> uh, that that was really a fluky thing, and and probably a circumstance that maybe not wouldn't really happen like that today. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. a role that size, and it was, it, I mean, literally, I mean, totally unknown actor um, coming from Chicago. Um, I think the, I think the reason was this, they had three viable iconic actors already in the movie. They had Carl Malden, they had mm. Marie Saint, and they had Andy Griffith. Oh, so it isn't like they didn't have yeah, a reason to, to draw an audience. They did. I think the role was offered to, you know, probably several people, but it, you know, maybe because of the nature of the role or whatever, it's just, it remained vacant and they were ready to go. And then I, you know, I just kind of fell in the door. Well, it started a snowball, man. Cause you have, like I said, and I said at the beginning, you haven't stopped working since. So well, you know. I mean, knock, on, knock on my Formica table here. You know, so, uh, so which far. brings us, which brings us to a familiar thing. So, someone that you and I both know very, very well is an executive producer. He's a writer and a creator, and he created a little television series um, called American Gothic. You familiar with this show? I've heard, I, I've heard it was ahead of its time. Yes, I've heard that too. I've heard that too. And he was the he was the creator, the executive producer, writer of that show, and 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 you, I believe you played the devil in the form of like a Southern sheriff, right? Well, we always argued that it wasn't the devil, but it was possibly the devil's uh, secretary or <laughs> driver <laughs> or co-pilot. We never liked to call him the devil. He was just like the devil's assistant. <laughs> you know, okay. Like, being okay. Like too full of ourselves. And okay. the guy that was sort of, we were, you were bantering, bantering back and forth. Of what is he? Is he the, the driver? Is he the, um, this guy, just so you know, and we should clear, I should, I should clarify this for the audience. This guy who is truly a torturous, teasing, tumultuous, slightly terrible, but more often terrific sibling by my brother's name, Sean Cassidy. Yes, he is. He is all those things. And he, he created that television show. Tell me. Tell me and be honest. What are your thoughts about Mr. Sean Cassidy? <laughs> well, for, I'll just first of all, I'll just start with the you know, what you know, re remembering reading that. Two reactions to it. The first one was halfway through. I said, I want to do this. I'm not. Even, I didn't even finish it, and I said I could because clearly, and we have to remember when that was. This was in 1994. Mm -hmm. I, I think I got that right. Mm -hmm. There was no such thing as anti-heroes on television. There was no there was no darkness that that leveled this this kind of a this kind of a story. And then, of course, my reaction was like a lot of people was, and I said, and, and by the way, who wrote this? Sean Cassidy. <laughs> The guy in the spandex pants. The I, I guy. Got <laughs> wow, connect those dots. Um, but you know, and then you know, it, but then I went, went, you know, I, I remember meeting Sean in his office and and uh, talking about the, the show and and uh, you know, it's still to this day is one of the favorite as as far as a part goes, playing a part, one of the favorite things I've 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 ever done, and I wish now that I've had. A couple of experiences of, of doing a series for a length of time. I really regret that it didn't go only because I would have enjoyed seeing where that character and that oh. show gone for at least a couple, two, three more seasons. So. I couldn't agree more. It was it was ahead of its time. And and you know, people like you said, this is Sean Cassidy wrote this. You know, Sean, because of, again, because of his image as a performer and because he got he had the teen thing. He's an incredibly insightful and dark writer. Yeah. He writes dark, and and 
It's like my mom likes to watch, you know, uh, documentaries about Ted Bundy. I mean, she she watches movies, you know, documentaries about serial killers, Shirley Jones. But she likes documentaries. Premier musical theater and film. That's actors. exactly right. You know, <laughs> she likes to watch, you know, but, but Sean is and he's written a lot of stuff like that. And also the cast, Lucas Black in that show, you know, to, you know, I, I don't know if, if you've you know, how much experience you've had working with, with kids. But I remember doing a scene with Lucas and I think my, I, as we were doing the scene, I was looking down and I, they were, they had gotten my coverage and they were shooting him. And he was like, he, he was actually had to be, you know, like upset about something or, or something where his, his energy was really riveted up. And it was, I mean, I wanted. I I, I kind of just turned to somebody and said, "You know what? I I think I quit because <laughs> he's eight, and uh, I'm never going to be that good. So I'll, I'll just I'll just hang it up right here." And for some people who might not know, Lucas Black was in Sling Sling Blade with Billy Bob Thornton. Matter of fact, he was between the pilot and when we began shooting. I believe I asked him. I said, "So have you been working a lot?" He goes, "No, I just do this." And then I'm gonna go off and do a movie with Robert Duvall <laughs> and Billy Bob Thorpe in uh, in Arkansas somewhere. Oh. I don't know what it is called. Something something about a blade. I don't know. <laughs> oh gosh, so, you're kidding! I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, you're gonna go up work work with Robert Duvall and Billy Bob. Thorpe. <laughs> I'll be here, uh, you know. Sweating out the pilot and see if. We <laughs> and who else? Who else w was discovered in that show? That a very young Sarah Paulson. Yes, a very young Sarah Paulson. You know, if she was, I think she was like 17, 18, something like that. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. I think about that, and yeah. you know, yeah, no, it was ahead of its time. It was incredibly written, written show. And and, I, and there, one of the people came on, I think Jennifer said that she thinks it's being replayed on Peacock. So look for a residual check. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that's going to put weight in my wallet. Where's Peacock? Where do you find that? <laughs> okay, so you're gonna laugh at this. I know you, I've, you and I have talked very, you know, openly and transparently. And so, I'm going through your resume with our producer, Mr. William Geis. And, and I said, you know, Gary's an amazing guy. Is all this stuff he's done in show business, but he's the most down to earth, incredible person I know. And, and yet, you know, he's got this, and this is me, Gary. So you're going to forgive me, but I go, you know, he's got this incredible speaking voice. I don't think he's done any voiceover work. And William is going through your stuff and says, uh, Patrick, he's done hundreds and hundreds. He's been on two of the biggest voice shows there is. And so me with the egg dripping down my face, realized, hmm, well, we'll I guess we'll have to show a clip of that. So your voice credits, Mr. Cole, include Family Guy as Principal Shepard. There he is. Wow. Rick and Morty, Harvey Birdman, and Kim Possible. And we're going to show a little clip here from Family Guy of you as Principal Shepard. Attention students, this is Principal Shepard with the lunchtime announcements. And as a special treat, I thought I'd deliver them in the wrapping style you kids are so enthused about. Later today, you're gonna have a big thrill, cause shortly after lunch there'll be a fire drill. And when you go out to wait for the bus, mm, go in orderly fashion or your hair will get mussed. You suck! No, you suck. I can't hear you, I just presume somebody must have yelled, you suck. Anyway, last announcement. Don't forget, it's time to vote for Homecoming King and Queen. Nominations are due by 3 p.m. today. Peace out. No, you're a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, God. Forgive me the voiceover, God, that I didn't know just how great you are at that, too. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean... Rarely do I see, I just catch, sometimes I just catch it by accident because, you know, in animation, you do everything beforehand. I never saw the visual for that. <laughs> you know, I, I laughed when I did it because it was just, the, the writing is always so good, but I, I never saw the scene. So it was, that was cool. <laughs> it's hysterical. That was cool. I just assumed somebody called me douchebag. So. <laughs> <laughs>
just to cover myself. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, guess what? It It's the perfect transition into this next moment. So on this show, I might have mentioned it to Nancy Allen in the first segment. We do a game normally called Remember the Lyric. And the show and the game, the game is because a lot of musical theater people is I, and I know what they've done. I sing a lyric from a show and a role they did. And then they have to come back at me with the other lyric. So me not knowing you as a big musical theater guy, I thought, well, he's a he's in, he's got this incredible voice. We just heard it. He's an incredible announcer. So we're, we've just for you, Gary, we we have a new little game. It's called You're the Voice of Studio 10. <laughs> there it is. It's right below you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a small little setup. And you just in your wonderful announcer, Gary Cole voice, you get to say it out the way it would be seen. So here, here are the things. Oh, I'm going to get copy, in other words, to read? No, no, no. No, no. You're going to create it on an improv. I'm going to give you a tiny little improv. Here are okay. the three things. And you get to do them in your announcer voice for Studio 10. You Okay. One, that we, Studio 10, are a struggling theater company in Franklin, Tennessee. Two, that the artistic director is a B actor. He's a B actor. <laughs> and three... That you are not you, that you, the voice guy, is a non-singer, but you're going to attempt to sing some of this this voice of Studio Ten. So, do you got the improv? I, I maybe I think I'm lost. But... <laughs> All right, I'll help you here. Give me an All example, right. and I will, we'll we'll try for it. I am the so it's just an announcer. You're going to do an announcement for a struggling theater company in uh, in in Franklin, Tennessee. A B actor, artistic director, who runs the company. And and oh and how about a, a good shout out for a donation? My my producer. Told oh, me. I see. Okay. So okay. This, this is of a pro promotional variety. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the voice of Studio Ten, Mr. Gary Cole. Good evening, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I don't know what uh, hour of the day it is where you are, but it doesn't really matter, does it? I'm the voice of Studio Ten. My name is Joe Ten. And I'm coming to you via my uh, lair here in an undisclosed location. I would like to, uh, shall we say, beg is such an ugly word, but I would like to, to uh, ask your help in, uh, in trying to keep afloat a uh, struggling organization known as Studio 10. They just... Um, Procure the services of a uh, actor, uh, uh, so-called, uh, okay, a B actor, who is a marvelous administrator, director, musical performer, and teacher. And with the help of your generous donations, if you can so find the bottom of your pocket, please give this to Studio 10, and the B actor, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Patrick <laughs> Isidia. I'm sorry, no, Patrick Cassidy. Thank you. I believe, uh, I believe the rest of his family was in show business in some form as well. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I'll, I'll read my history. Thank you and good night. Oh my God. It's the great, we're changing the game. The game is no longer. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. This is great. Ryan is crying. My brother is <laughs> crying watching this. <laughs> Jennifer says, hire this man. Gary, if we don't, I, you know, you just saved our company, Gary. You saved our company. <laughs> what can I say? All in a day's work. Oh, you are just too great. Oh, my God. Oh, thank you for that, my friend. You, you, you reacted just brilliantly. Oh gosh. Okay, so moving right along. So I I have seen so beyond so much of your work. Uh, but as you, I think you know this. My children, Jack, who lives here, and my son Cole, twenty five and twenty two today. Jack came That's up to me. Day, yes, he. They came up to me when you were we are we were at something, that, and they literally said to me, "Dad, that's Reese Bobby." <laughs> And I and I said, "Who's Reese Bobby?" <laughs> I said, "I said, what are you talking about?" He says, "Dad, 
Talladega Nights, Reese Bobby, Dad, you got to watch it. Well, sure enough, they dragged me to the television, and I had never seen it. And it is the most incredible performance I have ever seen. <laughs> Lynn McAllister, just by the way, gave it a hundred dollars for for that performance, Mr. Hey! So I, 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 it is an incredible character. I, my kids are beyond Gary Cole fans for a lifetime, but I want to just remind our audience who Reese Bobby is. So take a look at this. As a prison guard. Uh, excuse me, darling. I'm Reese Bobby. I'm here for career day with my son, Ricky. Dad. Hey, hey there, boy. Man, you got big. How long has it been? Three, four months? Ten years. Ten years. Man. I gotta lay off the peyote. <laughs> Mr. Bobby, there's no smoking in here. Oh, it's all right, darling. I'm a volunteer fireman. Okay. I am a semi professional race car driver and an amateur tattoo artist. And the first thing you gotta learn if you're gonna be a race car driver is you don't listen to losers like your know it all teacher over here. Okay, I think that's enough. The teacher wants you to go slow, and she's wrong because it's the fastest who gets paid. And it's the fastest who gets late. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. You think we're in the wrong. I just want to sell in the wrong. This is egregious. Do you hear me? Oh, God. It's just. Okay. So I see the movie. And I become the ridiculous Gary Cole fan. You're crazy in that movie. It's phenomenal. How was that? What was the what was the reaction to you after you played Reese Bobby? Well, yeah, I always say Reese Bobby, Father of the Year. Certainly. <laughs> um, well, it just, I mean, you know, it it was it. The 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 great news was that it was, you know, I hadn't done a I hadn't done a movie in quite a while. Like the last movie I did that really anybody paid attention to, I think, was Office Space. So this was. This was five years later, five, six years later. Uh, and it was a big movie. I mean, it was, you know, Will Ferrell at the time was, uh, and, you know, everything was different. I mean, even the business was different than, you know, uh, you know, comedy features, you know, were, were at the time, if they were successful, were, were, had a pretty big, you know, pretty big uh, audience for a weekend. Um, but I just had, you know, it, it was one of the most, fun experiences I've ever had. I mean, that character, <laughs> that, that script, that Adam McKay directed it, who's directing, you know, everything now. And, and, and he's just, he was so specific that scene you show. And I, they, they show that scene a lot. If it, if they're, if it's something about me where he stands there and he's talking about, I'm an amateur tattoo artist and I'm this and I'm that. Well, he, Adam McQuay, he's like a writing machine. He just stood behind, behind the camera. There, there's, there's 20 minutes of footage of me telling these eight-year-olds some inappropriate occupation that I am. You know, that <laughs> happened to be the one that, that landed, and he, he was back there hurling it the whole time. And Will Ferrell was, you know, I mean, he, he was just so generous and, and, uh, and funny, and, and uh, I had not done a lot of improvisation Really, I mean, once in a while, I found myself, but in that situation, it, it, it wasn't like a. It was all of that was. It, it wasn't improvised. It was. It was a. It was a really good script. But there were times when they were. We were allowed to just kind of let it. Let it flow. And uh, being with somebody like Will Ferrell, it, you know, it was. It was hard to, you know, hard to fail at that. Well, it, it also prepared you so brilliantly for the voice of Studio Ted in, in, in pro. <laughs> it, my friend Trent Mill says, Gary, you'll always be Lundberg and Mr. Brady to me, although the voice of Studio Ted might be a contender. Thank you, Trent, for that. And Debbie says, oh, yes, the Brady Munch, hilarious. And the spot on Mike Brady, is there any role this guy can't play? You know, I, I have to say, Gary, too, Mike Brady. I mean, I know Robert Reed. Anybody who's ever watched, I knew Robert Reed. I, anybody who ever watched that show, and what did you do? Just study him? Did you study, get the sound of his voice? And Yeah. I mean, we Betty Thomas, who directed it, uh, who did a fantastic job, and, um, and I remember that the, I don't know whose idea it was to leave the Brady's 
in the 70s and then have everyone else, you know, keep <laughs> going forward. Move forward. So really it was kind of a it was kind of a, a tip of the cap to those old fish out of water sitcoms like the Munsters or the Adams family mm -hmm. or I Dream of Jeannie or and you know, Watch because family. <laughs> right. No, but, but but I mean but the, the, the point being that they were, the comedy really came a lot from, for, from two things, the reactions of people to them. But then we and Betty wanted to make sure that there, we reminded everybody of the cast of those actors that were on the television show. That was the point. Mm -hmm. And when I started to watch, and we borrowed the script, borrowed from like six or seven episodes of the actual Brady Bunch. And when I started to watch it, I was like, what, I can't, what, I'm trying to get a hook some here. And then I started to realize that he, he somehow he had the ability to make a word that, that had two syllables in it, all of a sudden contain seven, <laughs> you know, especially when he talked to his children, you know, he would, you know, Greg, you know, he, he, he just had this, this cadence that was kind of like a, you know, a, a roller coaster up and down. Uh -huh. And then of course, when he told the moral of the story, we wanted to make sure he was as vacant as <laughs> possible. <laughs> so that it looked like when he told the story, it looked like the entire family had just taken a Valium. <laughs> you know? And that was, that was the goal there. So. It says huge Gary Cole fan. Let's not forget. Yes, we were we were going to show a clip. Well, there's just so many clips you could show, but Midnight Caller and so many great roles, including his award winning work in Veep. Yes, thanks, Evans. We uh, no, there's I, man, there's a lot of YouTube footage on you. A lot. <laughs> you are. It is. It's. A, it is an incredible thing. I. Uh, I, I, I'm in awe of you, my friend. I'm just in awe of you. You are as, but, but you know something, Gary, I, and I've said this to everybody that's, because there was so much uh, anticipation and excitement about you doing this. And I said, guys, he's a great actor. We all know that. The industry knows that. You are a better human being. And you know I know that. Well, you are, you are right. a better human being than you are an actor. And you're a right great back actor. to you. Right back to you. Um, I, uh, I, I want to show, uh, thanks to Evans uh, talking about Veep, I, I do want to show a clip from Veep. Uh, I have not seen Veep, but I saw this clip and I went, okay, there he goes again. He's done it again. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Veep with Mr. Gary Cole. Let me, Ken. These three binders, sir. No, that's Cherry Red. Cerise. I'm sorry, sir. I must have a very specific form of colorblindness. I cook these noodles every day. Oh, the noodle analogy. You guys are going to love this. I will eat. They need to be heated at 800 watts for three minutes and 35 seconds. Any more and they'll dry out. Any less, they will be flaccid and damp like a lady's hair in the rain. Why are we talking about noodles? No, let me rephrase that. Why the fuck are we talking about noodles? I'll tell you why. Hostage crisis, noodles, same principle. Both require precision timing. Neither should be rushed. Inaction only becomes untenable when more than 65% of Americans support intervention, even with casualties. So you'd like me to tell the vice president we do nothing until then? Waiting is not doing nothing. I choose to wait for my noodles, even though my salivary glands are crying out to me like newly hatched birds. But they will thank me because I waited until. Well, you just timed out that whole shit analogy for your little ding that is fucking pathetic <laughs> gary this this show segment the 17th week segment of studio 10 i i can't my mouth has been in this position the entire time it's you're you're i i know you were funny but that funny really gary <laughs> yeah that, that you know that's, but, but you, we all know, I mean, that's, that's great writing. And, uh, and, and I watch every time I watch that, I'm so kind of touched by the fact that I've known Kevin Dunn for, I guess it's going on 40 years now. <laughs> we had, when we did the show, we knew each other from Chicago way back. We barely worked together. I think we did one thing in LA together, but we've known each other forever. Uh, and so, you know, the, the combination of that cast 
uh, those writers, and then the stakes of you know the United States government uh, were you know it, it all it all worked. Let's put it that way. It sure does, man. Um, <clears throat> this has been an unbelievable fun and and pleasure uh, for me, man. Just to see you again. You look you just you look great and. And, you know, it's and, you know, I mean, you gosh, we've been in such close, close contact the last year and a half. You know how the, my life has completely taken another turn. You're going where? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Yep. Oh, of, <laughs> of course I am. And then I thought is immediately. And then I thought I remember because you when did you go? It was in the fall, right? Didn't we you? were here. Well, I went to, yeah, I came to, for, I call it the Intel visit where I kind of like, you know, went to see what was going on. I, right. I kind of oversaw Cinderella, the rehearsal period. I saw the show and kind of learned, you know, about where I was in Franklin and, and the Studio 10 and all that. And then I came back and got Melissa. And then we drove here and we were here with our furniture and stuff in January. In <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's go, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I'm right. a rehearsal. Oh, right. right. <laughs> well, no, no, exactly. We've been inside much more than we've been outside since wow. we've gotten to Tennessee. You know, and I thought that it was like it just dawned on me. I said, wait a minute, didn't Patrick go to Nashville to run a theater? You know, like like I, I thought of that on you know April second. Like, <laughs> yeah. I wonder how that's going. <laughs> Pro probably differently than he suspected. <laughs> yeah, which is that's right. Can you do another donation speech? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> By the way, we didn't anticipate uh, the yes. drop in our audience because uh, because of some droplets <laughs> making their way across the country. That's right. <laughs> No, it has been yes, as you as you said, it's to say the least. It's been an interesting time. I say that though, I am I am still so fortunate to be here. Uh, our, our our board chair, Mr. Tony McAllister, said, "Great show, thank you, Mr. Cole. He is he and his wife Lynn are amazing, and they are well, really looking at Patrick. They are they are the the reason, and I am and I am thrilled. I'm thrilled to be here. I miss people like you, my friends, and I miss my family." Um, but I am here with my wife and my son, and I'm here with Studio Ten and some newfound friends, and uh, and we will all come back, and we all we will all come back, and um, and again, my friend, I can't thank you enough for for making this show so great tonight. We do one other game on this show, and um, <clears throat> it's called "You Become the Host," and you get to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you already did your voice though. You don't have to do it in a voice. You can just okay, do it. Okay. You become the host, which means that you get to ask me oh. one question. Oh. Any question. Any I, question. Oh, that's I, it's kind of like putting your heart out as the actor and you, you know you're gonna be <laughs> Do we have to is there a is, do we have to is there a tone to this question that is uh, no way? It's anything you want to do. I anything I, I, I I just I, I caution you that we are in the South. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. You know what? You said something earlier in an interview, and just just to keep it on the topic of what our reality is now. You said when you were believe when you were talking. To, I, I'm sorry. Was it Nancy? Was it her name? Nancy. Yeah. yeah. You said something about in, in education, which you you think, and I think you're right, uh, and maybe it was leaning that way anyway. That this, what we are in now, is going to be the model of the future, at least partially. Now, in what you do and in, you know, I mean, in entertainment and teaching, performing, you know, that's, some can be done there, but but that will be a tricky, a tricky go without being in the room. You know, yeah. I was thinking about the one, the one experience I had, which I really enjoyed that I ever, I could say taught something was that I, I went back to my old university for the graduation ceremony and did a, did a commencement speech and all that. But in, while I was there was lucky enough to do a workshop with, with acting students. And the only, and the only thing I knew to do was that they showed me what they were working on. They were all doing uh, monologues to actually to uh, I, th I think to get into 
other uh, other programs or or later on when they were you know looking for jobs actually mm -hmm. and i just kind of messed with those some did scenes some did monologues and i just made a judge adjustments but i i suppose that could be done virtually um but it would be a boy it'd be a different animal you know and i just if if you want to talk a little bit more i'd be interested in that because that's when when you said that you know this has been our lives for the last six months it has been exactly what you're saying is true. We have in this time, in this period, <clears throat> it started with, we, we put together a musical theater contest and that came out of Gary. Literally, I was doing push-up contests with my sons and their friends on Instagram. They were playing games because right. we had nothing else to do. It was Yahtzee at night and push-up contests with your friends, with your friends and your kids in the daytime. And, um, and, and I thought to myself, you know, well, if all families are doing this, why can't we put together like a contest, something fun that would engage kids and families? So we launched this musical the theater song contest. Well, the submissions were off the chart. That then, and we judged it and we gave them uh, prizes. It was fantastic. That then created our education program. And the education program literally we did three camps, all really successful, and we, and I got to start teaching online. And Melissa, who's been here teaching at Nashville Ballet, at Hargis Dance Center, at uh, Christ Presbyterian, she hasn't stopped working. And it's a new adjustment of learning how to critique a kid this way. And she does it showing their feet, showing them dance. Wow. And, 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 you, and it's the same thing. I mean, will it ever be what it's like being in the room? No. There's nothing just like I, you, like I said, they showed Hamilton with the original cast on Disney with all the bells and whistles, perfect shots, great camera angles, all of that, right? It was a wonderful experience. Melissa and I saw it in New York. It will never be that experience. Right. And, and teaching, we can do it and we'll find ways to make it better and we'll find ways of singing and, and performing that way better, but it's still going to never, ever replace me being in a room with you, you know, right. which on a bigger level for me, uh, is the thing uh, we live in a world, as I've, I've said this many times, of massive, massive communication with l very little human connection. And I miss that. And I miss it in this way, you know? Yeah, good point. Yeah. I, I adore you, Mr. Cole. Same here. You, you are such a gem and a gentleman and a, an amazing guy. And I thank you so much for being a part of this. You, you will raise many donations just with your voice. <laughs> well, I hope, on. I hope so. By the way, say, say hi to Melissa for me. I will, my friend. Great right. to see you. And to Mary. Give my best to Mary. You got it. You got it. All right, buddy. I'll speak All to right, you. All right, man. Bye. Bye, Studio 2. <laughs> oh, I'm drained of laughing. Literally, my smile is like, oh, God. I knew Gary's funny. Uh, your classes, camp is amazing. My daughter loves him. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you. We are having such a joy uh, teaching, uh, Tanya, great interview. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you so much. We, we're having a great time. Connection is so important. Thank you, Jennifer. I, de I definitely agree. Um, we have taught all virtually. Thank you, Janet. Thank you for the shout out. We have taught virtually this, 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 this time we will continue to do so. We will continue to ease back into my wife says, thank you, Gary. Bye Gary. And, uh, it has been, it's been, it's been great. I mean, we have discovered a lot and that's what happens is that human beings discover, when things are, t are tough, they discover new ways of making things better, and that's what we're doing here at Studio 10. I want to remind you guys, please, uh, your donations matter to us. And you can see it in your screen there. Uh, Studio 10 will be um, going on campaign, uh, camping, campaign by clicking the donate button above and mess messaging Studio 10 Talks. The phone number is there, too. Um, thank you for today. I always sign off with a, with a song, and I was thinking, which one did I do tonight? And I have I have I done goodbye old girl? Did I do that one, guys? I don't, I don't know. I think we did it. I think we did. I'll do that one. I'm getting I'm getting told by my producer. Uh, so this is from Damn Yankees. Goodbye, my friends, all my friends. Good night, everybody.